Thank you, and, and good morning. It's an absolute delight to be here, and I'm especially delighted to be part of an event that honors Maureen and Ted English. Uh, Ted and I have been friends for years. We served on the BJ's board together, uh, and I can second the notion that he and Maureen are huge assets, uh, not only to higher education through Northeastern, but to each and every community that they're involved in. So I'm just honored beyond belief to be uh, on the platform uh, at an event where he's being honored. Also, it is just absolutely amazing to see this full a room of hungry people. Uh, hungry for knowledge, hungry for insight about corporate philanthropy, but you are in fact the folks who have self-selected into this place. So you already do, you know, you already do the right things. So what can I possibly tell you that you can use to influence other people in the process? And so uh, let me set the context for my comments today um, and, uh, and give you a little bit of a background about me to be able to understand the level of profundity that I'm going to leave you with here by 9.05. <laughs> um, and the arguments I'm going to leave you with. So, uh, so in the introduction, they talked about the fact that I spent most of my um, adult life as an academic at the Harvard Business School. Um, and, uh, and got tenure at the Harvard Business School uh, for being able to articulate a set of uh, incredibly profound insights around the area of service management. Uh, so what I want to be able to do is give you some sense of the level of profundity that's involved in this uh, and how it might help you to understand what we're going to be talking about here today about corporate philanthropy. <laughs> So in the area of service management, I'm known for being able to articulate three fundamental principles that are associated with service excellence. The first is to find out who your customers are. You got that? <laughs> there are pens and there are notepads over there, OK, <laughs> if you want to make sure that you'll be able to get it. The second issue is once you find out who your customers are, find out what they want. That's the second, okay? That got me to associate professor. <laughs> okay, and then from associate professor to professor it was, give it to them. <laughs> and I'd stand up and I'd go around the world and I'd say these things, and at one point in the process, um, I invited my father when he was still alive to sit in a room like this and hear me kind of spew this nonsense. And I did it in a room like this, screaming at people with flip charts running around. And it's all done, and I ran back to him, and I said, so, Dad, what did you think? And he said, uh, so, uh, this is what you do. <laughs> and, I, and I said, yeah, 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 this is, this is what I do. He goes, um, these people, I said, they seem to like it. <laughs> yeah, you can understand why I'm still working through this. My dad passed away eight years ago. I'm still working through the, the, the neuroses that have been stimulated. The, the, uh, I, and I said, yeah, that's not what I asked you. I asked you what you thought. And he finally says, well, you want to know what I think? He said, I think every morning when you wake up, you should start the day singing God Bless America. <laughs> he goes, the fact that you can actually make a living telling this to people is absolutely nothing short of extraordinary. Right? So now I go through that. I go back into retail, become a college president. And here I'm going to come talk to you about another topic, corporate philanthropy. And let's talk about why the, the topic is so incredibly important personally and for our mission at, uh, at Babson, and then what the implications are for each and every one of you. And I promise you the same level of insight uh, that's associated with figure out who your customers are, find out what they want, and give it to them, OK? Um, first issue, I will admit to a deep and profound ideological bias. Right? So rule number one is uh, you uh, live and operate in a community I believe you owe it, period. Now, I'll translate that into the broader conversation about entrepreneurship that pervaded the nonsense of the political uh, arena, which now has provided me the opportunity to actually watch television without commercials um, a day later. But the reality is we got into this silly argument about entrepreneurs, whether they did it all themselves or it was all done for them. And I mean, it really was a silly argument. First of all, there's this mythical structure associated with entrepreneurs engaging in solo acts, OK? And the vast majority of all entrepreneurial ventures are done by teams. So, so the reality is nothing is done as an individual. And secondly, uh, whether you frame it as infrastructure was done for you or with you, at the end of the day, how about just reframing the argument from an egotistical argument of I did it myself or it was done for you to we did it together? 
Okay? And let's talk about the issues of corporate philanthropy and our relationships to our communities instead of we did this for the community or the community laid out this infrastructure for us to the community and the organizations together have banded to do something together that neither of the individual institutions can do on their own. Now, in order to be able to do that, you have to get into a broader conversation about business in general. So I come back to, after years and years and years of being an academic and then nine years going back to industry, come back to an academic institution and I find the same silly old arguments, okay, uh, about the uh, business of business is business, okay? Uh, and the reality is Milton Friedman has been dead for a long, long time. And he was wrong when he said it and he's still wrong now. Um, and uh, what we've done at MAPS and associated with that was to actually make a unilateral commitment to the wrong-headedness of Milton Friedman by being, in, in our case, the third institution in the United States to sign the UN Principles for Responsible Management Education. And the principles are really very simple. The principles argue that we have reached a crisis point in Western capitalism uh, because of the obsessive focus on economic outcomes to the exclusion of human and sustainability oriented outcomes. And that we have a responsibility as institutions in the world, but most particularly now we'll talk about in the community of Metro West, we have a responsibility to figure out ways to build businesses that can attend to human and sustainability oriented goals simultaneously rather than sequentially. For those who study the history of American philanthropy, you will discover that there is a portfolio of exploitative uh, uh, business leaders who looked in the mirror and discovered an extraordinary amount of guilt. Alfred Nobel started the Nobel Prize because he read his obituary before he died. Right? Literally, he read his obituary before he died. He saw what they said about him, and he said, oh shit, I better do something else. <laughs> okay. And you watch the History Channel, and you can read about John D. Rockefeller, you can read about Andrew Carnegie, all the great philanthropists in the United States who engaged in the economically suboptimal strategy of making a lot of money and then figuring out how to give it away. And we're arguing that, God, what a waste, okay? Literally, what a waste. What if we could actually build enterprises that could do that at the same time? So uh, as the third institution in the United States, now interestingly enough, this has now been around for several years, um, of the 25 leading business schools in the United States, not one has yet signed on. Not one. Uh, so what I consider to be intuitively obvious at the level of the profundity of my opening comments about customers apparently is still a source of great controversy, uh, which is why in January all of these business people have to go to Davos, okay? Uh, and, uh, and, and debate the principles. Now, why was this a priority for us? Well, I think it provides an opportunity uh, to create an educational context so that we're not fighting these battles 30 or 40 years out. And it's an opportunity to recognize the kinds of arguments that have been coming up increasingly in the literature about businesses' responsibility and the opportunity to create shared value. Now, part of the issue I'll argue here is it's not only it's not only an obligation, it's a huge business opportunity. Just a huge business opportunity. And it gives us an opportunity to recognize that it is going to increasingly become an expectation for our corporations. Um, you, many of you have children, right? Uh, you all understand that your children look at you and essentially say, by and large, um, many of you um, got squeezed in ways that your parents didn't get squeezed. This is the first generation, the millennials, the first generation that cannot look forward to a life as good as their parents. And as a consequence, they're wondering what you did to screw them. <laughs> There's a level of fundamental mistrust, okay? Literally, fundamental mistrust of business enterprises and everything else in the world, a level of cynicism. Uh, that is associated with the current reality of business organizations, as well as a fundamental change in the relationship between individuals and organizations that is best represented by the notion that we train people to be employees in a gig economy. Right? Now, what does that mean? What it means is an average young person going to college today, particularly if they go to a college that has any prospect of them being employed at the point of graduation, uh, it can look forward to 10 to 12 jobs in their career. This notion of making a lifetime choice of connecting up to an organization at a, a single point in time is just gone. And so when we're in the gig economy, people are actually taking their guitar and their suitcase on the road, trying to figure out 
what the best possible gig is in terms of the nature of the employer and the uh, utilization of their skill sets at a given point in time. And there is no question in many of the same ways that consumers are thinking more actively about the behavior of the organizations they're engaging in, employees are thinking more aggressively and actively uh, about the nature of the employers they want to connect up to and the periods of time that they want to connect up to them. Now, I'm not going to underestimate the difficulty of reconciling the issues of profitability and human sustainability or in outcomes. But I am going to suggest we need to move to a model that enables us to develop strategies to do that. And I believe we have some examples literally in our own community that help you to think that through. Now, organizations really do go through a number of transitions as they move from being focused on purely economic goals to arm's length philanthropy to economic goals with integrated philanthropy. So let me give you a sense of how that process works, at least from our own experience. I'll talk about three different case studies, one in Boston, one in the Metro West region, and one that's global. And in each, a company has really figured out a way to engage its employees and its customers in philanthropic activities that are smart business, alongside all of the traditional, critical uh, community philanthropy activities that we know we rely on uh, as an important part of our community development. So smart business means venturing into new territory. Uh, what we at Babson call corporate social innovation. It's about social relevance, and that applies to a company of any size. So as I'm going to give you these examples, I'm going to also talk about small, medium, and large size organizations. So hopefully you can fit yourself in there. Uh, when you're trying to make an impact, you can be relevant with 50 employees, and you can be relevant with 400,000 employees. And we'll try to look at both. And the reality is if you're smaller, you can engage more directly with your employees to make sure that what you're doing is relevant both inside and outside of your company. Now again, you want to do this quite honestly, but not because it's in your community interest, but as well because it's in your interest. It's going to help you to attract the best and brightest employees. It's going to help you to attract uh, a loyal customer base. 